So our next session is about uh, AHRC New Generation Thinkers Scheme. So we have um, Toby again, who's going to introduce the scheme. And you have worked um, very closely with this. You work on this scheme. Yes. And we have Dr. John Paul as well, who is this current uh, new generation thinker. And uh, she's going to talk about her experience um, in this scheme. So New Generation Thinkers is not a, um, a specifically a film thing. It's about trying to find um, early career researchers who are interested in being communicators um, and using a wide range of media to do that. Um, in particular, we work with Radio 3, uh, but I'll come on to that in a moment. So what are we looking for? Now, this is a photograph of our latest cohort of New Generation Thinkers. Unfortunately, Joanna has slipped into being now being a New Generation Thinker alumni. Um, apparently, I've been told that once you become a New Generation Thinker, you never cease to become one. So when you're 75, you'll still be a, a New Generation Thinker. Yeah, my head's done. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I said, just uh, in February, we unveiled our, our newest uh, uh, collection. So each year, we select 10. And uh, these are a new generation of academics. And what we're looking to do is find people who are interested and have compelling ideas that they want to bring to a broad audience through working with the media. And there's all different types of media that we're looking at. Um, and it really is a chance for early career researchers to cultivate their communication skills. And um, from AHRC's point of view, it's one of our main channels for public engagement. You know, uh, compared to other research councils, we're pretty small, we've got a small budget, we don't have big science festivals, we don't own Jodrell Brank and observatories around the world, but what we do have and what the Arts and Humanities have is compelling stories and fascinating people. So it's all about trying to find um, uh, more and more people that we can push out through the media to communicate with the public. Um, and so far, we've now been running, running this since 2011, um, and we now have, with the latest 10, 80 new generation thinkers who are all out there um, communicating with the public and advocating for fantastic research. So what takes place? Um, now, the initial thing is that we work very closely with Radio 3. They're part of the selection process. And um, once um, the final 10 have been selected, they all go forward to make radio programmes with uh, Radio 3 on their um, free thinking um, thread. Uh, it's not just, and actually the BBC are really keen to, sorry, it's turned itself off again. BBC are really keen to push forward that it's not just the final 10 they work with. If they come across people they think are interesting or interesting ideas and subject matter and are good communicators, they'll use them. Um, I, in fact, just recently in this latest round, we had a lady called uh, Laura O'Brien. Um, she worked on a uh, fascinating area of work, impersonators of Napoleon. And, uh, but, and before, she didn't get selected to be in the final 10, but before that actually had happened, she was already on Radio 3 doing a whole programme about Napoleon with a bunch of ac other academics. Um, and the Radio 3 are also working more closely with BBC Arts and BBC Four, and they're looking for uh, new generation thinkers to work with uh, BBC Four on documentaries as well. Um, one of the things that we do from AHRC's side is we... Um, Part of the process is with our final 10, we put together a, a media training program. For this, um, uh, this year, we uh, built up two days. So we've got a whole day of media training on broadcast media, working with um, radio and TV, but also working with social media um, and working in, uh, in the written form as well. So blogging, how to pitch to newspapers and other uh, media as well. Um, and then what happens is, is uh, while you're also, they're also working with Radio 3, we work with a lot of NGTs to, uh, sorry, that's the abbreviation by the way, NGTs, I'll claim that now and then I can keep slipping into it. Um, so the NGTs um, work with us and we find the blogging opportunities, we get media phoning up looking for interview uh, 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 potential, so, and, and we're always referring people to the media. Um, also, as part of our uh, public engagement, we're looking constantly um, and more so as well to build up our opportunities for speaking events. So we also uh, fund a um, festival called the Being Human Festival, if any of you have heard that, it's a festival of humanities. And uh, a lot of the NGTs put on events 
in that and my head of comms Mike Collins is really keen to try and do more of that um, and offer us some money so it's potential for for this year um, and also one of the big things that all of the NGTs do is they go up to the Free Thinking Festival in Gateshead which actually is this weekend so the new cohort are going to be unveiled and also I think last year you're all going to be presenting an essay as yeah. yep yeah. be dating with Ian McMillan the Poets so it's going to be I'm looking forward to seeing that one um, and uh, what we also do is uh, we we as part of our promotion opportunity uh, promotion we uh, AHRC we uh, invest in filming and photography opportunities so we get f uh, professional photos taken of all of the um, NGTs and also we do some filming so we've just done some at the BBC um, and Last year, we did it at Sage. So this is Islam Issa. Uh, he is um, in the same cohort as Jan, and he um, specialises in the interpretation of classic English literature, so sort of like St Shakespeare, as well as Milton, and how that is interpreted around the world, particularly in the Arab world. So if I just click on here, um, and that should link me through to one of the two-minute videos that we put together. But this is very much about use through social media. My name is Islam Issa and I'm at Birmingham City University. My research is interested in the way that English literature is read around the world, and specifically in the Middle East. I think one of the issues we have is that we're told what to read and we're told how to read it by a certain group of people. So we have kind of mainstream readers in literary academia. What I'm interested in is those that aren't necessarily in the mainstream. I'm delighted that the BBC and AHRC think that this research matters to the general public. And I hope that given the current global political climate and the kind of relationships between the East and the West, thinking about how these canonical English writers are read and received in the Middle East can actually build some bridges and get us to understand one another, but not just through the similarities, but through the differences as well. When things are translated and interpreted by different cultures, sometimes they take things away. But what we also have to remember is that they add things, so things can become adapted to the culture. And it's really fascinating to see some of the ways in which Shakespeare, for, a bit, for example, has been adapted into that Arab setting. I'm hoping to provide the audience with something they haven't really heard before, to get them to think outside the box about how these writers, that we think we, we've really exhausted, how we really haven't exhausted them, and the ways in which we can really build, build bridges between cultures by finding out the, the, the ways that they've been interpreted around the world. Okay, so it's just a... Uh... Now we could sit here and watch all of them. <laughs> they're all listed on our YouTube channel, which I recommend you go and have a look at. Easy to find, AHRC Press, and uh, all of our films are on there. Um, so moving on to the next slide. So um, getting down to the nuts and bolts of it. So the application process is that we have a, our call normally opens around July, just before uh, the summer break. Um, and then closes in October, so in the new term. And so it's a long call, but because we understand that, you know, a lot of people are doing a lot of things over their summers, but it also gives people an opportunity to um, really get their uh, application honed. And I'll come on to that in, uh, in, uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, we judge it in H AHRC and BBC. So this year, we had about 250 applications. Uh, the number has come down over the years, but the quality has gone up, I think, so that we have uh, less quantity and better quality. So actually, it's quite a, a, a hard thing to whittle down 250 to a short list of 60, which we do in uh, November and then in January. Um, and then from there, we that final 60 are invited to workshops run by Radio 3, uh, two in London and one in Salford and they're run in January, and from the way people perform on those, uh, the final 10 are selected to be our new generation thinkers for that year. And what we've started this year as well is that we publicly unveil them in January, P apologies, in February, which we've just done, um, and 
I think up until last year we did it at the Free Thinking Festival, but we've done we've brought things forward a little bit so we can bring more media in and get more sort of interest because unfortunately everything is London based and that's where that happens. So we do some media training, um, do a big photography and, and video session which we did at Broadcasting House this year, and in the evening we had uh, a, a drinks reception to unveil our NGTs. So, how do I succeed? So, if you are really interested in doing this, um, it is a commitment. You don't get paid. You do get paid for the stuff you do with Radio 3, but there's no bursary. You have to find your own time to do this. But it is hugely beneficial to you uh, if you're interested in being a communica communicating academic. Um, there's, so, there's loads of opportunities. Uh, I'll let jo Joanne talk about that. But, uh, for example, Islam is one of two or three entities this year already have their own literary agents. Um, you get opportunities not just to work with the BBC, but um, uh, you get, uh, I think Channel 4 are interested in working with some of our new generation thinkers and some of the documentaries they're putting together because they're trying to increase their uh, arts and humanities coverage and their history coverage. So what happens is, is um, I really recommend you to work hard on your application um, uh, you, it's very easy to see the ones that have been dashed off in 10 minutes or you know, a couple of hours. So the two, th two main things you have to do is a programme pitch, and Radio 3 are particularly looking for that. So what we want you to do is you to pitch a potential programme for radio. So think of a subject, how that would be brought out and how you would expand on it, who would be involved, what sort of resources you would use, who would be the interviewees, etc., etc. Um, and then we also ask you to do a review. Um, and it's a review that is nothing to do with your subject area. And again, show that you've put some effort in. Don't review MasterChef that you watched last night. Or, you know, um, show that you have a hinterland, that you go out and you're interested in things that are away from your subject area. Um, and also think about, it's really simple, what are you trying to say in that review? Because there's a lot of people, and also think about writing in a review style. So go away and look at how uh, you know, professional reviewers review things. Don't try and do it in an academic style. Uh, in your programme pitch, think about those guys who, at Radio 3 who are going to be reading that, who are professional film make, uh, programme makers. And they will be looking at that and thinking, yes, I can see a film in this. Uh, sorry, I keep saying film. I can see a, a, a radio programme in this. Um, and th again, you can think about that audience and think about how they're receiving your pitch. So what we're looking for are communicators, people who, can, who, are, who, who find it easy and are really interested to explain their research and also uh, not just their narrow area of research, but developments in their subject area and also things wider than that. I mean, Radio 3 keeps saying that you know, we all bring people in to go and review films that you know, have a certain, certain area in, uh, you know, have a connection with certain academic areas that uh, the new generation thinkers are working on. They've never reviewed a film, but that's not what they're interested in. If they were, they'd bring a film reviewer in. They're interested in your original ideas about how you responded to that, that media. And so, as I said, original voices, people who are coming up with uh, um, original, eye-catching ideas, things that are going to make up um, <coughs> journalists and members of the public's ears prick up and say, that is really interesting. Um, and passionate. You know, it, I, I'm not talking about people necessarily waving their arms around and being over the top, but just people who are really passionate because that, is, that really comes across when you've got good communicators. So what I'm, uh, I thought I'd do is just um, a, little, a little bit like two-minute media training here. So as I mentioned earlier in the first session, always think about your audience first and foremost. If you get that, then everything else will follow. If you're thinking about yourself and your work and uh, your, your, um, your supervisor, you will not be communicating to the public. So be an academic, so have gravitas, have um, authority, but don't be academic. Don't, you know, we've got to cut out the jargon. Don't be verbose. Really cut through. If you saw that interview with Islam, he explained his work really simply but effectively. And... Um, I've put at the bottom here, research. So go away and uh, look at people on TV, listen to people on the radio, listen to the NGTs who are already uh, doing their programmes on Radio 3. All of the free thinking programmes are available online. Um, 
Civilizations is on tonight. I think, now I, th I think my first person I've clicked, I put here, this is Mary Beard. She's, uh, you know, she, Mary Beard's fantastic. She's been uh, an academic for a, a long time and she's a very good communicator. And I think in the last few years, she's started to break through into becoming a bit of a household name um, somewhere, somebody who's considered up there with people like Simon Sharma. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play a quick clip, about a minute and a half of an, an hour-long documentary. But just have a think about what she's talking about and how she presents it. It was mid-afternoon on the 22nd of January, 41 AD. In the morning, the Emperor Caligula had been to the theatre, but he had a bit of a hangover, so he decided to skip lunch and freshen up with a quick bath. That's where he was going, all on his own, down a back alleyway in the palace compound, when he was jumped by a posse of soldiers. The first blow to his neck, or some said to his chin, didn't kill him. But the next 30 or so did. One nasty rumour said that the assassins ate his flesh. Caligula was just 28 years old. He'd been in power for less than four years. It was an extraordinary moment in Roman history. Only Rome's third emperor, it's Caligula, who has come to stand for the corruption, horror and excess of Imperial Rome. Psychopath and depraved, he is said to have ruled by the sword, to have made his horse into a consul, and have insisted he be worshipped as a living god. And ever since, he has become a template for tyranny, with chilling echoes right up to our own age. One of Caligula's favourite sayings was, let them hate me. Some of them say, fear me. Okay, stop that there. And um, so, it's, that's the first minute and a half of an hour long documentary, so it's very, uh, simply laid out. But what she does is she does, um, she, she makes uh, historical figures seem very real. She talks about their everyday lives. Uh, she brings it into, in, into the terms of the, you know, the public who are sitting down on a, a BBC, watching a BBC doc documentary on Caligula can understand. Um, part of uh, looking at a good clip to show you of Mary Beard was uh, I came across a, a debate with Boris Johnson that she did um, called uh, Greece versus Rome. And she was advocating for Rome and he was advocating for Greece. And um, as far as, uh, I don't know who, I didn't get as far as, it's an hour and a half, I didn't get as far as see who won, but I know who won as a communicator. She it was far better than Boris Johnson. He did his usual thing of quoting Greek at people, uh, assuming that they all not understood who these uh, historical figures were, because he's very, very clever and he wants you to know that. Whereas Mary Beard is very, very clever, but she wants you to try and understand what she, uh, she knows as well. Um, so just going back, somebody else I've picked up is a guy called, uh, this is Robert McFarlane, the guy on the right. He, he doesn't have the same sort of uh, profile as Mary Beard, but he's a fantastic academic communicator. He's a bit of a friend of AHRC. Um, he's a literature scholar, but he works a lot on natural, natural history writing. He's fantastic on social media. He puts things on social media every day. He, uh, he, talks, he has lovely photographs. He um, talks about words from nature and expands them. So he's introducing to people to literature and, uh, and grammar and things like that without even realising it. And I'll just show a quick clip of him from Newsnight. There are two things that the British sentimentalise more avidly than anything else. Nature and childhood. But these are crucial subjects. And to me, it's unmistakable that a gap is currently widening between children and the natural world in this country. Oh, what an amazing oh, thing you found. Oh, two of them. Shall I just go off and get them? Okay. Three years ago, I read a paper in the journal Science and its findings startled me. It was about children's everyday knowledge of nature in this country. And what the researchers discovered is that children aged 8 to 11 were substantially better 
at identifying common Pokemon species than they were at identifying common species of British wildlife. For Weasel, read Weedle. For Wren, read Wigglytuff. For Badger, read Bulbasaur. Any conkers under your feet? Did you have about a thousand conkers? You have about a thousand, people, well, that's good. British children now spend on average less time outdoors each day than prisoners. They're climbing walls, not trees, under an hour outside. Screen time has soared and screen time is mostly inside time. Poverty, postcode, ethnicity, risk perception, these all affect children's experience of nature. But they all, in my opinion, need it. Shall we run everyone? Okay. Come on now. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Right. So, I mean, I thought that was a really nice clip because it's a five minute, uh, uh, six minute article. Uh, in a minute and a half, he's introduced to several pieces of academic research. He's had an opinion. His opinion is based in research. And uh, he's putting forward his um, thesis, if you like, about his concerns about uh, dislocation between, um, disconnection, sorry, between children and nature. So, um, if, if you're really interested in doing NGT. I recommend it. I think it's a really positive scheme. Hopefully Joanne will come tell you all about what the difference is made to her. Uh, but as I said, put as much research into this as you do your own work. Look at people. Find people you style you like. Work out what they do that you may want to consider. Because Mary Beard, for example, comes across as a bit of a, an academic, but a, an open one, and who probably invite you into her room and make you a cup of tea and tell you all about Caligula. Um, whereas Simon Sharma is somebody who's very grand. Um, David Olashoga is really good. Uh, again, he's worked with AHRC, but he, he sort of beats you into submission with his source um, uh, research, you know. And uh, so they've all got their own styles and their own way of doing things and you can have yours too. So I'll hand over to Joanne and uh, tell you a little bit more about it. Okay, while that's getting set up, um, I'll just say first of all, um, a big thanks um, to Sharon, who's continuing to work hard over here um, for putting this together and for inviting me. Um, it seems a really um, exciting um, opportunity. and I kind of wish I'd had it as a PhD student as well. Um, just a quick sort of show of hands, how many people before today had heard of the New Generation Thinkers scheme? Okay, so a few people, how many people had considered applying? Okay, well maybe we'll, we'll show impact um, by, by, the end, by the end of this session. Um, today I'm going to take you through um, my own sort of uh, experience with the scheme, um, so I apologize um, for any narcissism that may happen in the next 15 minutes or so, because um, it will kind of be about me, because um, Toby has already taken you through um, all the elements of the scheme. Um, I do want to start with a uh, sort of introduction of who I am. So um, I am Joanne Paul. Um, I am an academic. I am a lecturer at an institution which is currently on strike, and then is therefore emphatically, I will not tell you which one it is. <laughs> um, I'm not here for them. I am here for um, uh, NGT, for the AHRC and BBC Radio 3. Um, but I, I, am, I am an academic historian. Um, my research is mostly in the sort of 16th century, in, um, in, in the Renaissance, um, and I primarily work on the history of ideas. Um, and so I'm an intellectual historian, which I remember one time over coffee, somebody told me, um, oh, well, you can't make TV about ideas, haha. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I, I pretty much set out uh, from that point to prove them wrong. Um, so I am very interested in media work and sort of public engagement work. Um, I've been doing all sorts of things related to that. And so um, pretty much uh, from the beginning in my PhD, I had people encouraging me to apply for um, new generation thinkers. Um, and I didn't. Um, I didn't for years and years, and I'm actually now, um, this year will be my five-year viva-versary um, for my PhD, so I'm actually um, in, in the sort of older generation of the new generation thinkers. Many of them are actually um, in their PhDs or just finishing their PhDs uh, now. The reason that I didn't um, was that I thought I wasn't eligible because I am foreign. Um, turns out you can, so even if you're from another country outside the UK, outside um, the, uh, the EU, you can still apply. So eventually, oh, wrong computer, there we go. Eventually I did uh, apply and I did so um, primarily on the encouragement of previous NGTs, previous new generation thinkers. I include three here, um, who I am proud to count as friends, um, who really encouraged me to do it and helped with my application. Um, and so perhaps that is lesson the first. 
um, is, is get help and, and especially get help from previous NGTs. Um, most of them are very active on Twitter. You can shoot them a message and be like, oh, I'm thinking of applying. Question X about Y, um, right? Ask, ask them anything, ask me anything, um, and, and they will um, help you out. Um, so I did so because they had encouraged me to because um, I am interested in these things. And as Toby said, this is a great way um, to get that sort of exposure and engagement. And so I keep pressing the wrong computer. So, so primarily, um, I did apply for the sort of combination that Toby had described of, of training and exposure. Um, and really, what I've found um, is, is that the NGT experience, the, the benefit of it is really um, where those two meet, um, that really exposure becomes training. Right, um, all that experience is actually, I think, um, what gives you uh, the most information and, and the most sort of um, advantage of the scheme. Um, and I suppose thirdly, I applied because actually, um, I don't really come from a, 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 a place of, of having radio as part of my sort of everyday experience. Um, I remember when I went to the training days, everybody was talking about that they'd always come down. Um, uh, for breakfast and over tea and crumpets, they'd listen to the BBC. <laughs> and um, that is not part of my everyday. We, we do have the CBC in Canada, um, but it isn't as much as a sort of cultural phenomenon as it is here. And so for me, um, whenever I'd thought about media work, I'd always gone to TV or writing. And I hadn't really thought about this radio thing um, that sort of in a way sits in the middle. Um, and so it was a way of, of getting more engaged with that. Um, okay, and then the application process. Um, Toby took you through some of that already. Um, it is difficult often to just even come up with, well, who would care about my research? Um, there are days I don't, um, right? How am I going to try to tell other people why it's cool? Those days where I'm really excited about it, it's not so easy to communicate to other people why that is um, the, the case. And so it's often about thinking about ways in which um, your research can, can hook into other people's um, interests. Um, one of the things that I did, maybe this is helpful, is to think about connections. Um, so I'm a historian, so to think about connections between the past and present. Think too about developments, the way things have changed. To think about what's going on in the world today and how your research might be able to, to give a little bit of insight into that or to explore an element of that or to revive something that we've forgotten or even just to tell an interesting story. I know plenty of NGTs who have just told really interesting stories and actually the sort of implications and, and the sort of so what of those stories have come out as they've told them and as they've gone to events and as other people have said, oh, actually that relates to something I know or that relates to um, something to do in the news of the world around you. So sometimes those connections come about later on. The most important thing that I did, however, during the application process was to get help with the application. Um, and I said before about asking other NGTs, um, I also asked people in my department who I knew were quite good about sort of public engagement and so on. And so what I want to do is show you um, the draft of the uh, program proposal, just a piece of it, um, that I had put together and was really, really proud of. Um, and then uh, what happened when somebody gave me some advice on it. Um, so this was attempt number one. Um, this is the, the program proposal I um, had, had worked up. Speaking truth to power, the secrets of kings and ministers. Always get secrets in there if you can. It's one of those buzzwords that sells really well. How can we speak truth to power? How can we influence those who have political control over our lives? Such questions were at the forefront of the minds of Renaissance thinkers. In fact, many of the techniques that they came up with are still essential to how we do politics today. This program explores the innovative strategies formulated, whoo, I said formulated, by these Renaissance minds in exerting influence over increasingly authoritarian regimes, noting how they laid the groundwork for modern forms of political resistance and critique. Okay, so there's a couple of okay things I did in there. I said the word secrets, I asked questions at the beginning. That's all right, I connected it to things that are happening now. Okay, but it wasn't quite good enough. And so this is what I worked up um, in consultation with one of my colleagues at the university I won't mention. So still title the same. 
Imagine yourself in a room in the 16th century, crowded with books and lit by the flickering of a dying candle. You're an educated person. You know how that country should be run and to what end, the good of the people. But there you sit. From the window, you can just make out a castle or self-interested ministers whisper in the drunk king's ear, urging foolhardy narcissistic policies. You could never get so close to the reins of power. What are you to do? And for most of us, this scenario isn't difficult to imagine, so then um, I connect it to our experience today. And then I still give that sort of ending line about what the program is about. So the number one piece of feedback that I got was make it more cinematic, right? Create a scene. The other thing um, that I knew and had forgotten is you always want to say the word you <laughs> as soon as possible in any presentation, any, any talk, any program, right? Um, you'll notice that I asked you guys if you had heard of, of NGT um, and got you to put your hands up. That's a great way of engaging people, bringing them in. This is another way, is to set a scene around the people. Now you don't have to do it exactly like this, you know, with this sort of scene setting. I've seen all sorts of ways of writing these program proposals, but the basic principles remain the same, right? About engaging people, um, about um, using this sort of storytelling devices, of um, trying to make a much more sort of visual connection um, with the people who um, are, are reading or listening to what you're doing. Um, but the biggest lesson is get help, because this was not going to cut it. <laughs> I would not have made it if I'd sent that one in. Um, okay, and then the, um, as, as, as Toby said, I, I sent in the application, um, was um, very shocked and pleased to get invited along to the training days. Um, and the important thing about, I think, this process was that it was useful in and of itself. Right? So even if this application hadn't have been successful, I would have learned so much just from the process of applying. And showing up to um, those training days, those interview days, they were interviews, but they were, they're training days, really, aren't they, um, was, was useful in and of itself. And I actually left that day thinking, oh, well, I've learned lots, and you know, I, I, I blew it, but I learned lots, um, and was fortunate enough to get um, the call back as well. Um, so it is worth applying whether or not you think you're necessarily ready this time and whether or not it um, works out the first time you apply because the key thing is, too, you can keep applying. You can apply as many times as you like. Um, and then the experience itself. Um, so Toby already said um, there's uh, training. Um, the training is useful, um, but it is one of those things where it's hard to make a sort of one-size-fits-all. So you really have to make the most out of it for what your interests are are um, and to take little bits and bobs out of it, tricks like um, saying you or using the word secrets or whatever it might be. Um, what was most helpful about the training was when they finally plopped us down um, in, in front of cameras or in front of microphones and had us practice. Um, and the practice is really what's useful about this um, and about those training days and then about the actual um, experiences as well. Um, and then the, the working with um, the various sort of broadcasting um, teams and, and, and producers, again, they have this in mind that you are sort of in training, that you are learning. And so they work with you in a really sort of um, gentle and accessible way um, as you build up your pitches, um, as you work on your essays or whatever pieces that you're doing. So that's just some of the stuff um, I've done directly related to the NGT experience, um, so contributing to panels um, on radio, um, doing my own sort of little radio programs. Um, this Friday, I have a big NGT day because um, I'm going to be on Radio 3 at about 10 a.m. Um, doing a time traveler um, segment, which is just a little sort of, um, I think they call it a quirky bit of cultural history um, for sort of five or 10 minutes. Um, and then also on that day, I have an AHRC blog post that's going live. Um, and then, which is actually promoting a YouTube series that I did. And then I'm also traveling um, to Sage Gates Head for the big Free Thinking Festival, where I'll be doing an essay. I'll be on the early modern, the early music show, and then doing the speed dating. Sorry, again, that sounds very like, this is all the stuff that I'm doing. Um, but it just gives you an idea, hopefully, of the opportunities um, that are available. I'm realizing that how exactly um, this is sounding. Um, but that's the sort of thing that you can start 
to do. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is just about sort of moving forward. Um, as Toby said, I was a 2017 new generation thinker. It's really only this year um, that I'm starting to really make programs and starting to produce essays and starting to be on the radio more and more and more. It's a sort of slow process. And one of the most important things that comes out, I think, of the NGT scheme is you get on the sort of Rolodex of experts um, that I'm confident the BBC has somewhere. Um, the, this sort of list, it's not an actual Rolodex, it's, it's a searchable online database, but think of it like a Rolodex. Um, that means that, okay, oh shoot, we need somebody who knows um, way too much about Thomas More, and, and my name comes up, right? And so that hopefully this is something um, that, that builds over time. Um, but also it isn't just the stuff that's directly related to the, the, to the scheme that is an advantage out of this. Um, and so I just want to point out some of the other opportunities that have really come about because I've been able to put New Generation Thinker on the top of my cover letters or CVs. Um, and, and that's some, some, some TV work of, of various kinds. I want to flag up, especially if there's any historians in the room, um, some of the, the YouTube um, channels that are, that are helpful for experience. Um, and this one is, is viral history, um, if, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, I do ha also have a literary agent, and this year secured a, a book deal that with Penguin that I'm very, very excited about. <laughs> um, Thank you. And I don't think that would have happened if I hadn't been able to say that I was an NGT, right? Um, both to the lit agent um, and uh, to the editor that I'm working with. Um, so it does just, it, it opens doors, it, it greases wheels, it does all of that sort of stuff. Um, so I think that's basically, I, I wanted to, to be quite quick um, about this part of it because I wanted to, to really open it up to questions um, about anything that I've said um, and indeed about things that I haven't said, which is probably more relevant. Um, but I will just end by saying, you know, this is my cohort, which is now the old cohort. We are, we're no longer the new ones. We're one of the, the old new generation thinkers. Um, but, you know, most of us on Twitter, um, you can find um, most of us online. You can certainly find me online um, and uh, ask us any questions, talk to us. Um, the coolest thing about NGT really is meeting the other NGTs, um, sort of, of of every generation of the new generations. Um, they do amazing things, and my favorite, I think, part of this entire uh, year so far was at the Sage Gates Head um, Free Thinking Festival last year, um, when we had our sort of introductions, and each of us said sort of three or five minutes about what it is that we we do, and there were some questions, and watching all of them and listening to the cool stuff that they're doing um, was absolutely amazing, because it ranges from, yeah, Islam's working on um, Shakespeare and Milton in the Middle East. Um, this uh, uh, Hedda is working on bodily fluids in, in medieval convents, um, which is really, really cool. Um, Emma's working on um, writing about children and war. It, it, it ranges. Um, there's all sorts of really cool stuff. There's science and music is another one. Anyway. Really neat stuff, um, and so the, the best part of this experience is really um, working with everybody else in the scheme as well. So I think that's all I have to say. <laughs>